ahead and get started. So if, um, Lena, can you go ahead? Thank you. So, um, so I admitted a patient uh, who came in for work of a fever of unknown origin. Um, in short, she had been seeing infectious disease for this problem and was being seen in their clinic um, and was compa uh, complaining of various issues uh, for several months. Um, and then at this visit, she was complaining of continued fevers as well as intermittent epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, and fever. So was admitted to hospital medicine to uh, work up her illness. Um, so she's 42 years old. And prior to my current admission that I saw her at, um, she had actually left AMA maybe about three or four weeks ago prior to me seeing her. Um, during that admission, she was admitted for the same issue. She was seen for fevers of unknown origin. Um, they had started a workup, a very thorough workup, which I will go over later. Um, essentially, uh, in short, her infectious workup at that time had uh, returned negative. Um, but prior to completing most of the workup that they had hoped, um, she had left uh, against medical, uh, medical advice. I think there was a disagreement with how her anxiety should have been managed in the hospital. Um, so she's back now. And since that admission, she had a, had some improvement in her epigastric pain. Um, they had treated her uh, for candidal esophagitis at that time. And she attributes to uh, the improvement in her epigastric pain to some of the fluconazole that she had receiving. But she still reports night sweats and fevers of up to 99.4 degrees at home. Um, she said that this had been going on for about six months at, at the point of when I saw her. She also complained about episodes where she would pass out. She said that this is sometimes preceded by dizziness or lightheadedness, and she felt like things were getting worse and that um, her whole life is just kind of where she's living in a daze and everything's just blurred. Um, she also had some intermittent headaches going on for about five months, other various complaints, including feeling weak, sometimes feeling too weak to walk. Um, notably, she denied um, any additional abdominal pain other than the epigastric pain from before. She had chest pain, cough, dis uh, she did not have cough, chest pain, dysuria, nausea, or vomiting. Um, so the review of systems, I chose to highlight um, some of the positives now she had, like I said, fevers, night sweats, fatigue, weakness, unintentional weight loss. Um, at her previous admission, she again had the esophageal um, swallowing difficulties and epigastric pain, but said that was a bit better. Um, but she continues to complain of blurry vision, some nausea, vomiting, um, and also headache, dizziness, the passing out episodes, and also notably diffuse body pain and pain along the spine. I, and I just wanted to note that um, her history was somewhat difficult to obtain because at times would change. But um, I think the focal point of her complaints was fevers, fatigue, and diffuse body pain. And also this, uh, she complained about significant anxiety um, and was asking for something to help alleviate some of that. Um, some additional past medical history. Um, just some pretty benign issues from a review of charts. She had atrial septal defects and chronic pain, anxiety, and depression, um, and also some substance use disorder um, that was identified on a previous admission opioids, which at this admission, she did admit to using her cousin's opioids to treat her pain, um, benzodiazepines, tobacco, marijuana, and previously alcohol, but by the time I saw her, she said that she had not, she had stopped using for at least several weeks. At home, she was taking fluconazole, although it is unsure if she was taking the full course as prescribed. Um, she was also prescribed iron, uh, hydroxyzine for anxiety, some mirtazapine, pent pentoprazole, and, uh, and some caraphate or superfate. Um, surgical history, none noted. Um, social history, as previously used, uh, mentioned, she had some um, various drug use, uh, tobacco use, and prior alcohol use. Her family history is notable for a strong family history of cancers. Marta had breast cancer, um, some type of bone cancer, high blood pressure, 
and her father had cancer. One of her uncles had leukemia, and then the grandmother and grandfather only had high blood pressure. Um, and the only listed allergy that she had was aspirin. So, so at this point, uh, our team decided to do a very thorough chart review on her. Um, just given these various complaints and past admissions. Um, she had multiple hospitalizations and ER visits. So to kind of make it more clear to understand, I decided to put everything in a timeline to help us kind of picture her entire history. So in 2019, 2020, around that year, um, I noticed that she had very frequent ER visits for pain and various dental complaints. And this is just very generalized pain. In July of 2020, I saw an ER visit for which she also complained about pain, nausea, vomiting, and also syncopal episodes. Um, at that time, during her workup, they noted that she was hypotensive and that her TSH was low. And they um, did discharge her for follow-up outpatient. So she followed up in August 2020, about one month later in the internal medicine clinic. Um, she was complaining about the same things. Um, and at that visit, she um, received a referral for cardiology and endocrine. So she did follow up. Um, and in the same month, she uh, saw, endocrine saw someone in endocrine clinic. Um, and at that time, they were evaluating her for the low TSH. And they suspected that given her TFTs, that uh, she had subclinical hyperthyroidism versus sicu thyroid. Um, they recommended follow up for repeat labs, but the patient did not follow up on that visit. In September 2020, um, she had an OBS admission, an observation admission for, very, again, very similar complaints, nausea, vomiting. Um, during that workup, they thought it was perhaps related to her marijuana use. Um, she did also undergo a PET stress test for her syncopal episodes. That came back unremarkable, and she also got a CTPE protocol, which also returned negative and was eventually sent home with follow-up plans. So the following month, she saw um, someone in cardiology clinic, and their um, assessment was that she possibly had some sort of orthostatic hypotension. Um, they gave her some fludrocortisone and a prescription for a Holter monitor um, and recommended that she follow up all of that workup. But again, she was not able to follow up. In July of 2020, uh, sorry, 2021, the following year, she was admitted to the cardiology service for observation for recurrent syncope. So at that time, um, they noted that she was unable to fill her fludrocortisone prescription. Um, she was given fluids and refills of her medication. Um, she felt a little bit better with fluids and her fludrocortisone was refilled. Following that, um, Across, across the years from 2020 and 2022, just to summarize, um, again, noted multiple ER visits, again, for the same complaints of dizziness, nausea, bonding, poor appetite now, and also anxiety. March of 2022, um, there was an ER visit, and this was the first ER visit that I noticed that they measured some fevers. At that time, the workup um, saw that maybe perhaps she had a viral illness, um, and so she was uh, discharged at that time, again, with plans for outpatient follow-up. And then in June 2022, that's where she had her first full inpatient admission for workup of fever of unknown origin. Um, and that workup was, uh, I'm gonna go over a little bit more, but again, the initial infectious workup was negative and she had left um, prior to completion of workup. And which leads to our current work, uh, current admission. Um, so just to summarize, very frequent ER visits for very similar complaints, overall complaining about syncope, weakness, fatigue, pain, um, and then later started to have some fevers and 
spring to summer and leading us toward this current admission. So on her physical exam, her vital signs initially on admission didn't have any fevers, um, but on her blood pressure checks, it was notable that her blood pressures were 95 over 62. Um, she was a thin, um, young appearing woman, um, very interactive on exam, wasn't in any acute distress, um, but Initially on the first day of admission, she wasn't very cooperative with the exam, primarily because of anxiety and complaints of pain. Um, notably, the only uh, significant exam findings were a poor dentition, um, overall kind of withdrawn, um, just very worried about her medical conditions. Um, the rest of the exam was relatively benign. So we did an initial workup to start. Labs, of course, are as shown. Her potassium was low, um, but LFTs were within normal range. Her CBC um, was notable for a low uh, hemoglobin, uh, microcytic anemia. And also, um, also very significant was that her CRP and ESR was very high. Other labs, her urine drug screen was positive for marijuana, oxycodone, benzodiazepines. Her alcohol level was elevated at 14. Um, she had noted that she hadn't been using alcohol, however, and that she said she does admit to using oxycodone and some benzodiazepines at home, whether it was prescribed or not remains unclear. Um, the urinalysis, again, unremarkable. The thyroid workup was as shown her TSH was slightly low, um, T4 was normal, the T3 was uh, low. Um, and also we did um, a very basic rheumatologic workup and all that returned negative or within normal limits. Um, RPR, unreactive, we sent some uh, various other infectious um, workup. Um, this was all with the guidance of infectious disease. Um, histoplasma antigen was not detected. Her quantifiorum gold was negative, HIV negative, flu, RSV negative, um, COVID was also negative, and your analysis like, uh, demonstrated less than one white blood cell. Other labs, um, also relatively unremarkable. The MPO was negative, proteinase was negative, the IgGs were within normal range, and some other uh, infectious workup, her um, STIs we sent were chlamydia, GC, trichomonas were negative. Um, the CD4 was 904. Um, one set of blood cultures um, were also negative. Um, this was all from prior admission. Um, iron, TIBC, ferritin, B12, folates are as shown, um, but notably that iron, TIBC were on the low side. Um, so just wanted to summarize that these were just labs that were done on the prior admission. Again, fairly unremarkable, similar to ours. So other than the anemia and the elevated ESR and CRP, didn't really see anything very significant on labs. But during the first few days of admission, uh, she did have confirmed fevers on her vitals checks um, up to 39 to 40 degrees and throughout just complained about a lot of pain all over. Um, she didn't have any vomiting with us, but at certain points she would complain of some nausea. Um, and the, our infectious disease consultants continue to follow along to help with the workup. Um, and they had recommended three separate timed blood cultures about every eight to 12 hours apart. We drew three sets of uh, blood cultures and they all returned negative. Um, <clears throat> at one point, psychiatry was consulted to kind of help with some of the significant anxiety that she had um, at, because at some points it was hindering her workup a little bit. Um, so wanted to go over some of the imaging that we did get, some of the initial workups. So chest X-ray wasn't too significant. Some bivalvular subsegmental atelectasis, 
We also imaged her spine because of the complaints of the pain, which she said was focused along her spine. Um, nothing really there. Um, given her poor dentition, we um, obtained an x-ray, a Panorax x-ray, and it did show some multifocal odontogenic disease and dental caries, eroded crowns, um, but no real significant disease to explain the fevers. Um, we also did lower externally Dopplers to see if like perhaps a blood clot was causing this that can return negative. We did an MRI of the brain as well at one point because she was complaining at times of various headaches, it would come and go. It was a little difficult to obtain a full history, um, but nothing really significant. And we also got a repeat TTE this admission. She had one on the previous admission, but on our current mission that also returned negative without any vegetation seen. Um, we also got a CT abdomen pelvis with IV contrast. Um, and I underlined some of the more significant findings, but there were some trace bilateral pleural fusions. Um, the liver, she has some uh, lesions that are very nonspecific, but they were probably cysts, but either way, those were stable from prior imaging. Um, notably, nothing else going on in the pancreas, spleen, or adrenal glands. Um, uterus and adnexa had a simple cyst, but nothing significant or of note. The lymph nodes did show um, a decrease in some prominent aortic lymph nodes. It was prominent on her prior CT, but it did decrease on this one, and the remaining exam was unremarkable. So um, now I'm going to um, let uh, Dr. Berklin take over and to introduce her, Dr. Berklin um, is an academic hospitalist at Emory Midtown. Um, she's part of the division of hospital medicine within the Emory Department of Medicine. Uh, she's double board certified in the American Boards of Internal and Obesity Medicine and is an associate professor of medicine and an Emory Distinguished Physician who also serves as the site assistant director of education at the Midtown Hospital. Um, she's also involved in interprofessional education and with multi-level learners. She's also an alumni of the inaugural cohort of Woodruff Health Educators Academy, Academy Teaching Fellowship with a focus on learning assessment techniques. Now, she also co-teaches at the Academy. In addition, Dr. Berklin's an alumni of the Emory Land Laney Graduate School with a degree of Master's in Arts in Bioethics and also serves as a Chair of Ethics community, Committee at the Emory University Hospital in Midtown. And she continues to provide direct patient care in addition to serving as Emory Corps faculty. She's a fellow of the Society of Hospital Medicine and American College of, Phys of Physicians and her current academic interests include resolving ethical dilemmas at the bedside, addressing clinical scenarios that involve of emotionally challenging patient encounters and providing mentorship in the curriculum development and also incorporating learning assessment matrix in medical education. Thanks so much, Patricia. Well, let's, let's get on with the discussion of the case. Uh, for the convenience purposes, I will uh, stop the video so that we can just focus on the presentation. This is a very interesting case. I have no financial disclosures and we will be using Poll Everywhere um, if it works. <laughs> um, if you can please text CPC1115 to 223333 to join, then we can um, hopefully generate some interesting responses. So the goals and objectives of this discussion, by the end of this discussion, the attendees will be able to apply causal reasoning in the analysis of presented constellation of findings in order to create a differential diagnosis and generate recommendations for additional diagnostic modalities. We're trying to aim for a metacognitive aspect of our cognitive process dimension. And we will start with Poll Everywhere. 
um, this would be question ranking from the greatest to the least. Please rank the following constellation of signs and symptoms in the order of importance. And I offered a few options here based on patients' myriad of symptoms and complaints over the span of nearly two years. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with, with that. And I will go ahead and activate the poll. Um, we'll stop sharing for a second to be able to activate the poll. <clears throat> All right. Do you guys um, see the poll? Can you can you make responses? Thank you so much. All right, very interesting. So dysautonomia, oh, the answers can start to continue to trickle in. We're going to talk as we um, as we walk through. So autonomic dysfunction, thyroid abnormalities, fever, and hyper gamma globulinemia. For the purposes of this talk, I have a mouthful. I'm going to call it hyper IgG. Uh, seems to come in the first place, followed by the pain along the spine, periodic lymphadenopathy liver lesion and fever. So we see that the theme is that the fever pred predominantly present in our top two uh, runner-ups for the constellation of signs and symptoms. Now, Sir William Osler taught us, listen to the patient and they will tell you the diagnosis. This generational axiom has proven to be true. Um, let's see if it can stand in this case. The discussion of a case where patient misuses various substances, including cannabis and alcohol and opiates and benzos, and does not co uh, cooperate with physical exam and leaves the hospital before workup is complete, does not really um, adhere to medications. This particular presentation offers a very wide differential over fever of a known origin. And so let me try to get to my uh, presentation again. Um, and so with that, all right, um, we will we will try to discuss um, uh, this example and how grouping particular symptoms and findings might influence our clinical reasoning and the concept of causal reasoning that we will discuss shortly. So, FUO or UFO. Um, Fever of known origin is first described by Petersdorf and Bison in 1861, over 60 years ago. And the original defining criteria have been revised, uh, but only to adjust for the advancement in diagnostic technologies. Body temperature of 38.3 Celsius, fever on at least three separate occasions over the uh, at least three weeks. No diagnosis made after one week of inpatient hospitalization comprised the original criteria. This definition was later adjusted, like I said, to accommodate for technological advances and sophisticated outpatient modalities, increasing number of immunocompromised individuals, including those with HIV and AIDS, and more complex treatment options becoming available. So the revised definition proposed by Durock and Street in 1991 divided cases into four distinct categories, classic FEO, nasocomial, neutropenic, and HIV-related. 
The temperature cutoff of 38.3, which is 101 Fahrenheit, has also been questioned. And even though it remains at the part of the official criteria for FEO, it does not take into account immunocompromised patients who may not be able to mount a higher temperature. So the revised criteria allow for the definition of FEO to include temperatures that are significantly elevated above patient's baseline, but do not necessarily have to meet the 38.3 Celsius cutoff. Also, the fever being the predominant symptom, and no diagnosis had been made after obtaining the first phase of testing, which Patricia had eloquently outlined for us, CBC, CMP, chest X-ray, urine analysis, urine cultures and blood cultures times three with abdominal imaging. Um, HIV-associated fever of a known origin was defined as fever of more than four weeks duration uh, in the outpatient setting and more than three days in the hospital. Obligatory investigations, which have been recommended starting at 1997 by uh, the Klein uh, nomenclature, occurred in two phases based upon the presence or absence of potential diagnostic clues. And in, uh, blood cultures incubation uh, was suggested for at least one week. So let us summarize what is going on here. If we agree that the fever is a predominant symptom, then going back to Sir William Osler's differential of the fever of a known origin, majority of the diagnosis in this case are fair game. The classification of the fever known origin was available from the evidence-based review published in 2012, and some of the novel diagnoses that account for the presence of a fever of a known origin today were not listed a decade ago. Here's the most recent updated and extended list of the etiology of a fever of a known origin. This table demonstrates how our understanding of fever of a known origin and discovery of the medical conditions causing this fever have evolved. Epidemiology of fever of a known origin varies based on the etiology, the demographics, the age groups, the geography, environmental exposure, immune and HIV status. In developing countries, notably, as uh, an infection etiology of FEO is the most prevalent cause, whereas in developed countries, FEO is likely due to non-infectious and inflammatory disease. When investigating the FEO, a thorough history taking is important. A detailed history with a focus on the most important probably etiology based on the patient's symptoms is the key to pinpoint the origin. Information about previous illnesses, any localizing symptoms, any alcohol intake, taking home medications or not taking them, occupational exposures, exposure to pets, travel history, familial disorders should not be overlooked. Cancellation of patient reported symptoms should help providers narrow down the categorical etiology of fevers. As each of these, has clinical hallmarks. Highlighted in red are the details that we have available in our patient's HNP as it pertains to further workup of FEO. As we recall, our patient was not fully cooperative with the examination on a number of occasions and left the hospital prior to the evaluation being completed. As such, we have to accept that there's a lot of valuable information that is missing in this case for multiple reasons including lack of patient's cooperation with the diagnostic process. We also do not have the luxury of documented fever patterns, the utility of which presents a debate in, even within the different camps of clinicians. Importantly, fever should be verified in a clinical setting. Of course, the fever patterns should be analyzed if possible um, to uh, exclude the fictitious fever, but also to provide some additional clues to specific infectious culprits. For example, Tertian or quartan fever can be observed in prolonged malaria occurring uh, cyclically every third or fourth day. Undulant or undulating fever has been described in brucellosis, where fevers and sweats occur in the evening and resolved by the morning. Tick-borne relapsing fever can be seen in borreliosis, where week-long fevers alternate with week-long remissions. A similar pattern can be seen in pell Abstein fever, of Hodgkin's disease where week-long intervals of high and low uh, uh, fevers have been observed. Periodic fevers and cyclic neutropenia have been described and 
double quotidian fever, which manifests as two fever spikes per day, has been seen in adults, Steele's disease, malaria, and typhoid. So to go back and review um, the timeline of our patient's presentation, just sort of fresh our memory as we uh, delve into the discussion. She presented in 2019, had a number of admissions, multiple dysautonomia, abnormal thyroid um, tests, uh, multiple complaints, almost a multi-organ involvement of some sort, and a fairly decent workup for her dysautonomia, <clears throat> followed by um, uh, cardiac PET testing, again, uh, predominant anxiety and uh, for appetite. Now, with fever, uh, first time being described in March of 2022. Upon dissecting the constellation of signs and symptoms when diagnosis is uncertain, one of the most time sensitive assessment is appreciating patient's clinical stability. What is encouraging here is that despite her multiple presentations to healthcare facility, presence of type B symptoms and a number of confounding factors, patient remains stable, allowing the time to attempt to make a diagnosis. The review of patient's presentations timeline is helpful in that it allows us to observe a particular pattern, a propensity toward certain potential culprit, and perhaps interpret fever as not the predominant symptom, but rather one of the manifestations of an indolent or prolonged illness. So what is causal reasoning? When approaching the clinical scenario, the probabilistic approach to the causal reasoning suggested by Jerome Kasserer is helpful. Causal reasoning is a diagnostic process that is based on the cause and effect relationship between clinical variables or the available chain of variables. For example, the noted esophageal candidiasis is typically seen in immunocompromised hosts. However, none of the associated symptoms directly point to the immunocompromised state. Moreover, the method of diagnosing candida esophagitis is undisclosed, so it was not if it was not pathology proven, then an alternate etiology of adenophagia will present a different cause and effect relation. In addition, adenophagia might be mistaken for dysphagia, which generates another a different set of pathologic uh, diagnostic possibilities. In cases such as these, discerning what is pertinent and relevant presents a separate barrier to arriving at the diagnosis. In this indolent, seemingly chronic and latent course of patient's ailment, we're obligated to look further into the history of esophageal candidiasis. Presumed adenophagia or dysphagia or other symptoms led to the diagnosis of esophageal candidiasis, although it is unknown whether the diagnosis is clinical or pathology proven. For the sake of time, I am going to skip some of the specifics of diagnosing uh, candida esophagitis clinical versus pathology-based. I will just mention that there's a high list of high-risk factors, which none of them uh, pertain to our patient, that allow us, allows us to perhaps uh, start treating patients' uh, symptoms clinically without a pathology-proven diagnosis. Sometimes response to fluconazole serves in itself uh, as a uh, positive response to treatment, and, and so no further diagnostic uh, pl plan is required. In this particular case, we cannot be certain that patient has taken her fluconazole, so the fact that her symptoms have improved um, with questionable compliance to the fluconazole raises a concern whether she truly had a candidate syphagitis and truly uh, was suffering from adenophagia, or was it a dysphagia that was mislabeled or um, misdiagnosed or misrepresented uh, by the virtue of her complex emotional presentation? Again, presenting causal reasoning uh, with this multitude of symptoms, such as polysubstance abuse, cannabis, tobacco, and alcohol, in addition with the use of benzo and opiates, could certainly contribute to the neuropsychiatric manifestation, but could also be part of a multi-system disease. So we're gonna try to avoid anchoring on these components of social history for now. Pain along the spine with night sweats and low-grade fevers for six months is very concerning and perhaps could serve as one of the defining clinical features as we move along the diagnostic pathway. 
This autonomia that has been present for nearly two years can be attributed to adrenergic activation that has been associated with the mast cell activation syndrome. However, we have no additional history of atopic allergies or reactions or hypersensitivities that often coexist with MCOS, mast cell um, uh, activating syndrome. Now, visual symptoms manifest as blurry vision is certainly part of systemic disorder, unilateral hemicranic uh, hemicrania, um, headaches in the right hemicranium uh, present for approximately 12 months certainly pose a concern. But here with dysautonomia, uh, upon a chronological review, it is evident that she had suffered from dysautonomia for over two years or almost two years, making an acute illness an unlikely etiology, unless the acute infection was superimposed on another chronic debilitating illness. Dental complaints, pain, dysautonomia, with a history of syncopal episode, episodes is evident. What is also evident is the presence of low TSH uh, with suspected endocrinopathy that protracts over the span of two years, suggestive of sick euthyroid versus subclinical hyperthyroidism. Here, if we assume the sick euthyroid, then we need to have at least some idea of which extrathyroid illness precipitates the euthyroid sick state. Looking further, it appears that the workup for postural hypertension, uh, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome has been done, but really no treatment yet initiated, such as compression stockings, general fluids intake, or fluid or cortisone, which patient did not uh, comply with. Highlighted in red are the symptoms that our patient possesses. And uh, because pain was a predominant, one of the predominant uh, complaints, as, as um, Patricia was talking about, I've got a little bit of a shift to my clinical thinking, again, traversing the timeline further prior to the onset of fever, we could observe that she continued to present with symptoms of dysautonomia and pain and anxiety, it seems to dominate. Unfortunately, there's not enough information to suggest the presence of complex regional pain syndrome, but such neuropathic pain uh, without known nerve damage has been previously described and is characterized by ongoing pain disproportionate to the degree of tissue injury and persists beyond the usual expected time for tissue healing. It can be more localized, it can be associated with a trauma, fracture, or surgery, but also it can be spontaneous. Uh, such abnormalities include allodynia, hyperalgesia, um, vasomotor abnormalities, trophic changes. So going further, um, March 2022 is when we see the first evidence of fever. However, subsequent evaluations did not reveal any obvious etiology. Of course, patient left prior to the evaluations being completed. And um, I see that we're uh, running a little bit out of time. So I might just um, uh, forego this whole question. What do you think might be going on in here? If you guys are uh, interested, you can put some answers in the chat, but we will uh, get moving. So the next interesting finding is the hypokalemia in the context of this patient scenario. And here in the red, I highlighted something that is available uh, to us about this patient. Now, she presented with diarrhea and, uh, I'm not sorry, she presented with vomiting um, and abdominal pain. And so loss of gastric acid induces metabolic alkalosis and by that increases high uh, plasma bicarbonate level. And so when the water and sodium bicarbonate are transported to the distal, uh, potassium secretory site, then uh, the body starts excreting more of the potassium resulting in the hypokalemia here. For somebody who um, is uh, not very compliant with healthcare, uh, and when this hypokalemia is taken in conjunction with her history of poor dentition, orthostatic hypotension, psychiatric manifestations, could suggest the presence of an eating disorder, and particularly bulimia nervosa. Presence of bulimia could be the reason for generalized weakness, as well as the reason for some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms as part of the vitamin deficiency uh, syndrome. Vitamins A, D, K, vitamins group B, including B9. Um, in addition, she's posted as a thin female. Unfortunately, we don't have access to her BMI, but um, low BMI in patients suffering from bulimia is in itself a risk factor for bone loss and osteopenia. So some of these concerns certainly are uh, arising in this patient. And just to be brief about this subclinical hyperthyroidism that has been suggested to be present in this patient, again, the definition of subclinical hyperthyroidism is based only on lab, 
not clinical criteria, and the term probably represented misnomer. In fact, although the normal reference range uh, serum uh, thyroid hormones would be increased for the individual with low or undetectable serum TSH levels. And so um, it is important to recognize that subnormal levels of serum TSH do not always reflect the presence of subclinical um, hyperthyroidism. Subnormal serum TSH may occur in patients with pituitary or hypothalamic insufficiency or non-thyroidal illnesses or consequent to administration of glucocorticoids, dopamine, or metron, none of which is readily uh, available to our patients. So this is the category where she would fall in terms of her lab values. Uh, patients with subclinical hyperthyroidism, whether exogenous or endogenous, were found to have a higher prevalence of palpitations, tremors, sweating, nervous anxiety, um, fear, hostility, reduced feeling of well-being, inability to concentrate. Um, and another important finding is hyper-IgG that is noted in our patient. I've posted again in the red the reference that we have available for our patient. And as we know, hyper-IgG is the overproduction of immunoglobulins by plasma cells and is broadly divided into monoclonal and polyclonal. Monoclonal primarily uh, associated with plasma cell neoplasms, B cell lymphomas. Um, polyclonal, however, represent um, a series of eight uh, different uh, categories, um, which all of them are listed here. And so what we do find um, uh, is we're trying to stick to the hypothesis of Occam's razor that entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. And so what we're trying to see what are the symptoms and signs and conditions and multi-system diseases that could discern all of these symptoms and explain the presence of this myriad of multi-systemic issues. Um, so one of the polyclonal gammopathies that we can discuss is <clears throat> IgG4-related disease. And IgG4-related disease is an umbrella of a lot of um, multi-system involvements. It is a fibroinflammatory immune-mediated condition, which has extremely variable clinical presentation. You can see a vast um, majority of organs are affected. Um, <clears throat> they... Uh, um, uh, um, distinguish four different types of uh, phenotypes of IgG4 related disease, one of which um, has uh, predilection to the pancreatic gland, retroperitoneum, hand and neck limited, and mycolix or systemic type of IgG4. Um, and here I have listed some of these uh, in red, some of the uh, findings that are pertinent to our patient. Um, it, interestingly, aside from hyper-IgG, patients can present with elevated CRP and SED rate, um, and there's a female predilection. But none of this uh, really explains entirely the entire presentation of patients' symptoms over the span of two years. Now, the Sika syndrome, which could uh, indirectly uh, explain some pretty advanced periodontal diseases in, in this fairly young woman, could be seen as a, a mimicker of IgG4 disease as part of a Sjogren's syndrome. And another slide uh, to sort of discern uh, when would we interpret CRP versus SED rate, uh, which one of them appears to be a little bit more helpful diagnostically as it turns out that CRP um, has widely replaced SED rate as a marker of inflammation and tissue damage. It results faster, it peaks faster, um, uh, as well as the range of CRP measurement is more than five times that of uh, SED rate. So this slide is available for your um, uh, enjoyment and you can see that anemia and um, uh, can, can actually increase the SED rate. And we saw that our patient's SED rate is um, above the detectable range with said, uh, CRP still being very elevated. <clears throat> So when we're investigating the uh, undifferenti undifferentiated polyclonal hypergamoglobin, hyper IgG, uh, there's a huge and busy slide, but if we just focus our attention on this particular column that discusses the high CRP more than 30, then um, a whole host of diagnoses come to mind. One of them is a Castleman's disease. And again, for the sake of time, unfortunately, I do not have the luxury of going into all these details. All I can say is this is a, um, again, 
systemic sclerosis. It can be associated with hyper IgG. Um, uh, many of the hematologic diseases present with polyclonal hyper IgG, which represent a diagnostic challenge. And <clears throat> polyclonal, polyclonal hyper IgG is included in the agnostic criteria of idiopathic multicentric Castleman's disease and autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome. So here highlighted in red are the symptoms that pertain to our patients, effusions, full-like symptoms, type B symptoms, could be one lymph node, uh, lymphadenopathy, but we do not know whether there is any lymphadenopathy available elsewhere that has not been imaged. And of course, other symptoms, elevated sed rate, anemia, hypergamma Another consideration in this context would be consideration for extrapulmonary sarcoidosis, specifically sarcoidosis of spinal cord can be insidious, progressive. Um, and so uh, it's a, um, one of the um, 10 to 15% of the patients presented with extra pulmonary sarcoidosis have uh, symptomatic specific otolaryngological involvement, which involves salivary glands, larynx, and other areas, which could describe some of our patients' oppressive symptoms, some of her dysphagia, adenophagia, periodontal disease. Extrapulmonary TB, we could never ever overlook that. And yes, our patient had a negative quantiferon TB gold, but there was a study done in 2100 medical charts retrospective review that discovered that false negative quantiferon results were found in almost a third of patients with extrapulmonary TB. Uh, in the proven TB group, the negative, falsely negative um, quantiferon B results were found in almost 28.6% or 29% of patients. So it's a sizable amount of patients where extra pulmonary TB could be missed. And because of the variability of patients' timeline and, and severity and, uh, and duration of symptoms, I think that that's something reasonable to consider. Again, going into the polyclonal gammopathy, um, we, uh, if we assume that patient does not have a persistently elevated CRP, we only have one snapshot of CRP, um, then Sjogren's syndrome is another multi-system disease that should not be overlooked. And here's considerations for the Sjogren's disease. Again, our patient had a negative um, uh, anti-role antibody, but it, it's not uncommon, unfortunately, for people to present with a seronegative Sjogren's or to have a um, anti-lay SSB, which are present in 70%, 87% of uh, Sjogren's syndrome patients. And again, highlighted in yellow are the areas that are involved in our patients and certainly warrant further review and consideration. Um, in clinical practice, the kind of classification criteria for Sjogren's should not be used because we don't have a very robust diagnostic criteria for those patients who are seronegative. We don't know enough to really assume that she's seronegative. We don't have anti-law um, uh, uh, anti SSB, but the remaining three uh, markers are negative. This is a summary of primary Sjogren's syndrome criteria. You can see that majority of seronegative primary Sjogren's syndrome patients have oculomotor and oral symptoms. And again, what additional testing would you recommend? Ideally, it would have been loved to have a poll everywhere, but for the sake of time, we will um, not do that. Um, the 18 FDG PET scan, what about the PET scan? So it has proven to be effective, um, particularly in people with anemia, uh, microcytic anemia and weight loss. So go ahead and do it for this patient. This would be our recommendation. Um, and this is a proposed intelligent and rational approach to diagnostic investigation in patients meeting the new FEO standardized classification. It's a bit of a busy slide to end with, but uh, it's informative in that it provides the most updated framework for approaching diagnostic uncertainty when investigating patients uh, with a new fever non-origin uh, based on standardized classification criteria. And that concludes my discussion. Thank you so much. Okay, I think I'm up next. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Eli Wilbur. I'm a fellow in the Division of Infectious Diseases. So um, as was mentioned, this is a case of fever of unknown origin. And we discussed fever of unknown origin last week with Dr. Spicer. And just to recap, 
the rigid historical definitions are being replaced by a more modern definition uh, where we just consider the FUO syndrome to encompass cases where fever has been persistent long enough to exclude self-limiting disease, which is usually a viral etiology, and there's no known diagnosis despite a uh, a, what is thought to be a reasonable investigation. FUO can be stratified into four categories based on superficial patient characteristics, classical, travel associated, where the infectious differential is more broad, nosocomial, where we think about things that we've done to the patient, such as thrombo, embolic events, drug fever, and bleeding, and then immunodeficiency associated FUO. And again, here it's important to recognize that not all, not all immunodeficiencies are the same, your patient with advanced HIV is different than the patient who's just had a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Our patient in this case has a classical FUO syndrome. And so here you're, you're gonna start your evaluation, your first contact with the patient with a high quality history and physical, two to three sets of blood cultures, which ideally will be spaced out in time and all before antibiotics if patient stability will allow. You'll need to get an HIV screen immediately, as in Atlanta, advanced HIV disease would be the most common cause of an occult immunodeficiency that would cause you to move the patient from the classical bucket to the immunodeficiency bucket. And then uh, advanced imaging to screen for things that you cannot find with your physical exam. The next stage of the evaluation is to do targeted testing based on the things that you find in your history and physical. Biopsy of any amenable lesions seen on your PAN scan a strong consideration for tuberculosis, as tuberculosis is the most common cause of FUO, looking at global cohorts, and in U.S.-based cohorts is still found in most, uh, you know, most case series. Um, you also can, it's reasonable to, at this point to screen for rheumatologic, screen serologically for rheumatologic and thyroid disease, and to stop any possible culprits for drug fever. And then we get to this point where, um, we need to consider more invasive or more complicated testing if you still do not have a diagnosis. And here it's worth taking a step and examining our options. Bone marrow and liver biopsy are both potential, um, can both potentially be helpful, primarily in cases where you're trying, where the underlying diagnosis is a malignancy or a granulomatous disease. The yield for bone marrow biopsy improves if the patient has an anemia or a thrombocytopenia and the yield of liver biopsy improves if the patient has an elevated alkaline phosphatase. Although it's worth noting that the studies showing the utility of liver biopsy were conducted in patients living with HIV. FDG PET-CT is useful in that it helps you to localize inflammation and identify a target for tissue biopsy. And in meta-analyses of, of FUO, the yield of FDG PET is 30% greater than that of conventional CT with contrast. Finally, if there's still no diagnosis and there's no additional clues after revisiting the history and physical, it's worth considering metagenomic testing on serum or tissue, although the results have to be interpreted with caution as we saw last week. Finally, it's worth considering a watchful waiting approach with the patient as up to a half of cases with FUO will be resistant to finding a diagnosis and some, many of those will spontaneously remit. Thinking about our patient, it's notable that she's had a very long duration of symptoms. There's no red flag exposures other than her poor dentition. There hasn't been a focal uh, place on imaging that was amenable to biopsy, and she has elevated inflammatory markers. Um, as she moves to the next stage of her investigation, she's had multiple negative blood cultures. She's had multiple negative uh, echocardiograms without interval change. Her, screen for, her screening for rheumatologic disease is negative, and she has no risk factors for TB in addition to a negative quantiferon gold. She does have a personal history of anemia and a family history of malignancy, including hematologic malignancy. So she proceeds to bone marrow biopsy. Her bone marrow biopsy does not show any evidence of a lymphoproliferative disorder, and there's no uh, organism seen on advanced staining. At this point, Infectious disease recommends getting an inpatient versus outpatient FDG PET study, but another test is performed and I'll hand off to our next consultant. All right. Um, Okay, 
Hi, everyone. My name is Shazina Hafiz. I'm one of the uh, endocrinologists um, working as a full-time faculty with the Division of Endocrinology here at Emory. So uh, basically, um, we are really short on time. I'll just try to summarize and make a few quick points. Um, endocrinology was consulted after patient underwent uh, cortisol testing. These were her baseline cortisol levels. Um, that were done on two consecutive days, early mornings, and they were slightly on the low end of normal. Uh, this was followed by an ACTH stimulation test with a baseline cortisol level of 3.2, and a cortisol at 30 minutes was 10.4, followed by a 60-minute cortisol of 13.2. So this patient did have an inappropriate response to cocentropin stimulation test, followed by an ACTH level, uh, which came down, uh, which came out as uh, on the low end, which was 1.5. So uh, this basically can. Um, led to the diagnosis of secondary adrenal insufficiency in this patient. Um, we looked at her MRI brain. It was reviewed to look for any significant pituitary abnormality, which was not detected. Uh, but yeah, the diagnosis we thought in her case was likely a secondary AI. Um, she was placed on a hydrocortisone. We started slightly higher dose, 20 milligrams twice a day. Um, she improved symptomatically within the next 24 hours. Uh, um, surprisingly, the fever went away, but uh, symptomatically, she was feeling a lot better. Her abdominal pain, her nausea, her dizziness, all of those symptoms were um, really better in the next 24 hours. She basically looked like a completely different person, and she just wanted to go home the next day, and she was discharged uh, on hydrocortisone and was supposed to just wean it down to physiological dose and to um, follow up as an outpatient for reassessment of her HPA axis. So, um, yeah, basically, FUO, fever of unknown origin, I think there is, yeah, the multiple things that can be a part of this, but I think we do need to keep adrenal insufficiency as one of our diagnoses in mind. It is one of the miscellaneous ones, rare ones, but yes, we have to uh, keep it in mind because AI does present, again, with a lot of vague symptoms, nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite, fatigue. These can be chronic. These can be... Uh, gradual and onset, and sometimes they are more prominent when patients are undergoing any kind of recent stress or illness. Uh, so maybe that is what was bringing her back into the hospital. But um, yeah, she uh, had pro probably all of these, you know, chronic symptoms. Um, and yes, most of the time, you know, fever can occur as part of AI, and it can be confused with infectious etiology, leading to delay in diagnosis. Uh, the mechanism generally is considered that IL-1, which is an endogenous pyrogen, it stimulates your ACTH, which in turn stimulates um, directly through ACTH or through corticosteroid. Uh, it suppresses the immune uh, response, um, basically, uh, yeah, um, including the IL-1 production. So more of a negative positive, IL-1 uh, leads stimulates ACTH, and then ACTH in turn uh, suppresses IL-1. And in adrenal insufficiency, that uh, process is not uh, effective in leading to basically um, activation of the cascade of processes led by cytokines IL-1 and IL-6 leading to fever. So some clinical characteristics of patients, we just, uh, so I'll just skip most of this, uh, but more when uh, in some studies, you know, um, when patients were diagnosed with AI, about 30% of that, them did have fever and they were diagnosed a little bit later, almost a week later than those without fever. Um, and then most uh, female sex was uh, noted to be, um, to lower the risk of AI, whereas any recent surgical procedure um, presence of generalized weakness or presence of cough, this was associated more with uh, development of uh, adrenal insufficiency and fever. So then coming to the next point, why this patient had secondary AI? Uh, so yeah, so if you look at her um, toxicology screens, she every single time back in, uh, since starting from 2020 to 2022, she always was having positive opioids. So uh, this brings to another area, which is not as well understood, but we are seeing more and more of this is opioid-induced adrenal insufficiency. And it is more of a central adrenal insufficiency. Uh, we just need to keep this um, diagnosis in mind. Some of the very common ones are constipated, constipation sedation, but there are some endocrine-related as well, uh, which we need to keep in mind. Um, the mechanism is central. 
So it's not more primary adrenal insufficiency, it's more of a central because opioids inhibit CRF producing neurons in hypothalamus um, through mu, kappa, and lambda receptors leading to decreased ACTH and um, cortisol response. So, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, basically I'll just skip all of that. We just have to uh, keep in mind, it could be with, with all opioids, uh, morphine, fentanyl, tramadol. There are some case reports, case series that all of these are, um, can contribute. They're just not, we just do not have long-term data. The diagnosis remains the same, which is to get baseline cortisol levels, ACTH, and then do cocytrobin stimulation test. Um, try to basically, the treatment is generally, you try to switch opioids if possible. Uh, in her case, I think she was not even getting prescribed once. It was just from, um, you know, she was getting, um, I, we don't know how she was getting these opioids, but yeah, the treatment is generally to switch them to wean patients off of these opioids and then just continue to use glucocorticoids for replacement. Um, and until uh, you just keep on monitoring their adrenal axis and to see if it recovers or not. Um, some literature does recommend that just to check AM cortisol every three to four months in patients who are on chronic opioids, uh, regardless of their symptoms. And maybe disclosing some of these side effects will influence uh, patients on um, decision-making or whether or not they want to be on these chronic uh, medications. So yeah, just to summarize, the possibility of adrenal insufficiency needs to be considered in patients with fever of unknown origin, especially those with risk factors. And 9% uh, of patients that are receiving long-term opioids have adrenal insufficiency. Uh, so it's just something we need to be aware of um, and um, just educate patients on. So with that, I just, and I'll just end my uh, talk here. And if there are any questions, we'll be happy to answer. Well, thank you very much for everybody. And um, I know we, we are uh, uh, beyond the allocated time. Um, you know, um, we'll, um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask it now. Otherwise, thank you for your patience and uh, sorry for the, the delay. Thank you all.